while he was in the hospital, he found out that his character sold the radio station and that he wasn't going to be in the show anymore. When I think about another like streamline is Garrett Morse. He's another person. He's he's like uh he doesn't I mean he doesn't he's not in our faces off the camera, but he's been very consistent. Knowing you of someone of backstory, did he ever talk about his departure from Martin? You know, I didn't get to get into that in extensive ways with Garrett. But speaking of Garrett, I have nothing but love for Garrett. Garrett is such good people. I'm glad you brought him up because he and I keep in touch to this day. And we talk all the time. I mean, Garrett's career, as you know, is, is iconic. I do remember him talking about something that I think is heartbreaking regarding your question. And that is, you know about when he got shot. I remember him telling me that he didn't understand and that it hurt him to his core that while he was in the hospital, he found out that his character sold the radio station and that he wasn't going to be in the show anymore. And that it hurt him that not only did they let him go from the show, but he expressed feelings about not understanding why the support wasn't there. And I don't know all the background goings on. I, I have no idea why things played out the way they did, but I do know it was, that was heartbreaking. Yeah, to hear that. It's certainly heartbreaking to hear it, for sure. But I mean, it was heartbreaking for Garrett to experience it. Okay. And this is, I, he exposed, expressed that to you. Because, I yeah, that, that was a tough one because it's like, Stan, who he was on your guys' show. Not on, um, excuse Stan me. Stan on, on Martin, yeah. Such a lovable character in both places, in both shows. So, yeah, when that story did kind of come out or we um, were able to kind of rediscover different things. He did an interview a while back. And it was like, this is someone that we all love. So that was a tough one. The another role that you kind of getting out of Martin, another role was Spyro for original gangsters. A lot of people, that might be a, a total shift of what the masses may know from you in terms of energy-wise. How did you get into the mind state? For that character well as I said to you earlier I've done far more drama than I have comedy I did a I worked on a play uh, called extremities Are you familiar with that play it's a deep powerful play about this cat who's uh, a rapist uh, it was done on Broadway many, many years ago. Farrah Fawcett was in it. Um, but nevertheless, I had done that, that play along with One Flow Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, some Mammoth, I, I, a lot of contemporary plays as well as the dramatic Shakespeare and Chekhov, all, all of that, right? So for me, creatively, I had been digging into that kind of material for years. It wasn't a stretch for me. It wasn't uh, some crazy challenge to go to this dark side. I mean, we all have darkness and, and light within us. And getting that role, the way I got it was interesting because up to that point, a lot of people in the business had seen me in this kind of all American light. I played Bo Whitley, the quarterback on the sitcom Coach. I had been in all these roles as lawyers, you know, upstanding, uh, articulate, educated cats. Cool, no problem with that. But what I didn't like, in this business, depending on what people see you in, they tend to lock you into that. 
So here I was playing these upscale characters, but now I'm auditioning for the lead, uh, for the leader of this gang. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm tired of Hollywood seeing me as just the upscale cat, as just the guy who's in this sphere only. So when I got to the director, producer meeting, I took a big risk because Spyro, he doesn't take any shit, right? He's the leader of this gang. And I ended up having to tell the director, I said, listen, let me tell you something, because I'll, I'll talk to you about this, but he and I got into it because he expected me to play Spyro as a stereotype. His cat's name is Larry. He, he directed some of the, what is frequently referred to as the black exploitation films. Larry is a white cat and he directed some of those films back then, Black Caesar. He directed a number of things with Fred the Hammer Williamson. Anyway, I knew that I had to make some bold choices in the room to show the director and the producers that I could go to that dark place, that place that was uncomfortable, that place that was about ruthlessness, that place was about that kind of Machiavellian character. I'll do whatever I have to do. If that includes taking your life, so be it to make sure I maintain control of this group of men and this environment. This is my turf, right? So when I went in the audition, this producer and director session, they all stood up, introduced themselves. And I just looked at all of them. And I just, instead of fun conversation, like, oh yeah, good to meet you as well. That I didn't do any of that. I just looked at them. I would nod to a couple of them. I, mm -hmm, look at them. And there suddenly was this energy in the room like, is this cat okay? Is he okay? And I walked over and I sat in the director's chair. I took my big ass feet and I put him on his desk. And I looked at all of them in the room. And there was this sense of, what you gonna do? And the silence, there was just this palpable energy, this sense of, what the hell is he doing? So that, that was the setup. Now I go through the scene. I was already in the groove. That's how I got that role. Is that instinct kicking in or is just like something uh, overtook you? It, it's partly instinct, but it's also what I told you. I was sick and tired. As I am sometimes to this day of people seeing me playing these upscale, educated characters, which again, I want to be clear, I'm at peace with that. Why would I be upset? I do everything I can, whether it's comedy, drama, action, to bring humanity to the roles that I'm playing.